everyone. I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. As we gather, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and that has been home to a variety of peoples over the millennia. As settlers, we are grateful for this opportunity to meet here and thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We acknowledge the historic Mississaugas of the Credit, the First Nations people who were the treaty signatories of the territory on which we are meeting here this evening. Treaty number three, known as Treaty Between the Lakes 1792, remains today. Today, this area has become home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit people whom we share the land. Their achievements, their contributions to our shared community. As a community, we have the responsibility for the stewardship of this land for which we live and we work. We, work. we are reminded of the dish and the one spoon indigenous law that ensures that we all will have enough substance for, our, for the earth's creatures. We offer this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation between the indigenous, indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada. So my name is Tracy Curtis, and I would like to welcome you here um, this evening. So um, my, yeah, I am the chair of Bracelet of Hope, uh, a proud Guelph Rotarian, and a business owner and a mother of two boys. Um, so there is so much going on um, out there, and I've been thinking all day of just the, the, the couple of moments that I have with you of what I would like to share. And, you know, I, I uh, follow Oprah Winfrey very closely, and I, whenever I have these um, complex, uh, angry or nervous feelings, I think of her, and, and I know what she says, she says, um, this is what I know for sure. And that kept popping into my head today. This is what I know for sure. And I'm going to tell you just a few things of what I know for sure. What I know for sure is tonight's panelists of uh, Dr. Amory Zadlik, uh, Helen Fishburne, and Nicola Mercer, Dr. Nicola Mercer and Marva Wisdom are um, wonderful community people. They are mothers, uh, professionals, and they care deeply about us all and are, in, are working very, very hard for us all. I also know um, that we are all honored to be here with you today. So this started nine years ago. It was just a brainstorm. Um, it was actually initially started as a fundraiser for Bracelet of Hope because all of our fundraising, um, we were, were unable to proceed with it. And um, I was thinking our community needed to hear from professionals in a more of a casual open way where you could have a question and answer and um, that's how this started nine year, nine months ago. And so we are committed to, and we initially thought it was just going to be one, and here we are. So we are, um, as a group, committed to see this through with you. Um, and there are all volunteers. We're all taking our time out of, away from our families to be with you here this evening, but um, we, we are in it together. Um, so I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, and, and um, I want to, again, just thank Marva. So that, those many sessions ago, I asked Marva if uh, she would moderate the sessions for me. And uh, so little did she know, here we are, nine, nine sessions in, you're still hanging in, Marva. So Marva Wisdom is a dear friend and fellow Rotarian. Marva is a senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy for the University of Toronto, a senior equity and leader a practitioner, and is a City of Guelph's external lead consultant towards eliminating systemic racism. So Marva, we're so thankful um, for you walking through this conversation. And ladies, welcome Anne-Marie and Nicola and Helen. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll see you at the end. Thank you for your time. Enjoy, everybody. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking me um, back in June as we sat in the Musagetti's Foundation offices for Arts Everywhere 
and um, and had a session. We were socially distanced at that time. We were allowed to be in the same space. It's a huge office, and it was important that we were in the same space so that uh, the first time around we will be able to coordinate. And now we have become maybe we become uh, pros in some ways that we can have our far distance. It is really an honor and a pleasure to um, moderate this uh, with incredible, incredible um, leaders of our community, as Tracy mentioned uh, a moment ago. And I'm gonna jump right in to do the introductions, but before I do it, I wanna leave my very, very favorite um, quote. And the reason why this is important because uh, so much of what we're going through now is about how we feel. And more importantly, how we also make other people feel. So. Maya Angelou said, people may forget what you say and people may forget what you do, but people never forget how you make them feel. And I'm gonna suggest that we look at the motivation of what people say and how they make us feel and our own responsibility in how we communicate to support people, to support frontline workers to help them understand that we know they're being selfless. They're being selfless in helping us save our own lives and our loved one's life. So remember Maya Angelou as we go through this pandemic and how these professionals are making you feel. And let me introduce some folks who are doing their utmost best in a selfless way to make you feel somewhat comforted not perfect because we're not there yet. So first person that I want to introduce tonight is Anne-Marie Zajlik. And Anne-Marie is a primary care physician in Guelph. She's providing comfort and guidance to thousands during this pandemic. Anne-Marie became a Facebook sensation with her daily posts of encouragement and sound scientific knowledge about COVID-19 and other health issues. And then Helen Fishburn. Helen is the executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association of Waterloo, Wellington. She's a lifelong advocate for increased awareness around mental health issues. And she's dedicated her career to advancing of an improved mental health care system that will serve us all. And boy, do we need it um, these days, especially. And our very, very special guests, and I can't tell you how much it meant to our group that meets regularly for her to have said yes. Imagine a schedule like hers. I don't think any of us could possibly have a schedule as busy as hers tonight. But she recognized the importance of communicating to you directly to help you understand what you're going through to help you understand the process and to help you understand perhaps some of the decisions that are made to the degree that she is able. And we thank her so much for her leadership. And indeed, the work that I do is the breath of different parts of Canada, different parts of our county, different organizations. And everywhere I go, people say to me, aren't you lucky that you have the leadership of Dr. Nicola Mercer. And um, Dr. Mercer is our medical officer of health, of course, for Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph. And we are extremely, extremely happy. I won't get into all the details because I know she has lots that she wants to say. But what I'm gonna ask now is to ask each panelist to provide us with some opening remarks. And let me go through the housekeeping and the housekeeping tonight, just to make sure that we're on the same track. If you're joining us over Zoom, and I apologize, I'm gonna put myself <coughs> on mute for a moment. Marva, I think we still have you on mute. There, that's better. 
<laughs> that was a good drink. Um, if you're joining us over Zoom webinar link or Facebook live broadcast, again, we are welcoming you. We have 625 signed on and I know that more signs on a little bit later on. We're ready to receive your questions on any of those platforms. We want you to feel free to put your questions in Q&A. And remember, the making how you make people feel. So we're asking you to be very respectful and you have been all along. And we have no reason to think that you'll be any different tonight. So we thank you for that. We're gonna try to answer as many questions as possible. Some we will answer live, others Dr. Zadlik will answer. She's gonna be typing away some of the time when you see her head down, that's what she's doing. We are recording the webinar and we're gonna post it on the CMHA Waterloo Wellington uh, site. So no worry, you're not going to miss anything. And so without further ado, what I wanna to say tonight is if we can start with Helen and then with Henry and then with Nicola, and then we will go forward into your questions. Again, we thank you for your support and we thank you for being here. Helen, over to you, please. Thanks, Marva. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. This is our ninth webinar tonight and no doubt this will be our toughest. For those of you that have joined our webinars uh, since June of last year, you'll know that we have a formula. Our formula is to provide accurate factual information and also uh, to uh, provide compassion and support for people as they go through this journey. We have uh, a lot of tough news to work through tonight. We're here to make sure you get the facts. And we're also here to make sure that we're paying attention to how you're coping. Right now, COVID has control thanks to the new variants of concern. And there've been some new and really tough measures put in place both provincially and locally to take that control back. This won't happen overnight. Things are going to get worse and then they're going to get much better. We wanna start by acknowledging that we're all tired, we're discouraged, we're fearful, angry, and we're certainly sick to death of this pandemic, but we have hope and we're going to keep going. We have to. We are going to find our way through this together. We want Ontario's third wave to be our last. Tonight, with the support of our amazing colleagues and the Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Nicola Mercer, we will unpack all of this and answer the, the many questions that we know that you have. Thank you, Helen. And Marie? And I'm mildly typing here. Um, so I, I wanted to make more of a philosophical uh, comment. Um, it's been a really tough day and if I'm confused, people are confused. And I think we're confused because there are a lot of different leaders that may be saying different things. Um, so uh, just a few comments, stay calm. You have every reason to stay calm. This is not an easy time, but you're in really good hands. So take a big breath and stay calm. Focus. So I've said this in a recent post, focus on the end game because the end game is in sight and we will conquer this pandemic. And in a short four to six weeks, we're all going to be marveling at what these vaccines are doing. That's a short period of time. So please stay focused and calm. Um, follow credible information. There's so much misinformation. It is not credible, and I'll say this, it's not credible if it's not coming from a scientist, an epidemiologist, or a physician with good credentials. Before you pass on misinformation, please look up the person, just Google their name and find out if they are in one of those categories. If they're not, please don't transmit the information, you will instill fear. Um, grab the correct perspective. And there are two, two perspectives right now that I think we need to remember. This is our World War II. I'll call it a very mild World War III because no one is being blown up and no one is, is having to be in armed combat. Uh, but to have that perspective and understand what kind of sacrifice is required and how much hardship we're living with and how hard it's going to be right now for parents ah, to have their kids at home without very much warning in the name of saving lives, right? It's tough, but let's get that overall sort of higher perspective. And then the other perspective is hope in short order when we're gonna see these vaccines do the trick and very quickly, I think moving into the fall, get back to some semblance of normal. That's what I wanted to say. 
Oh, thank you, Van Marie, for that. Uh, I, I, and also for you, Helen. Um, I'm glad to follow you because as I listen to what you're saying, and it really resonates with me. I, I think for everybody who's listening, I'm, I think it was um, a little bit nervous tonight coming on, and uh, you've helped helping me to be less nervous. And, and my nerves are more about um, the fact that I represent for many people the thing that's um, hurting you, maybe keeping your children home or, or potentially hurting you economically or with your business. And, and I recognize that. And I also recognize that, that um, people feel angry with me and uh, not everybody, but I know a lot of people do. And, uh, and it is hard to wear that. And it's hard as a, as a person to, to be here and to answer your questions, but I will do that. And I will answer them to the best of my ability tonight to try and point you to the things that I know. There's some things I don't know, and I'll tell you if I don't know. Um, but I, I think the most important thing is we, we need an honest conversation about where we are and where we're going. And there is hope. Um, we just have a, a little bit of a six, eight weeks ahead of us where maybe it won't feel like it's there, but we, we, will, we will have hope in our future. Thank you on mute, Off mute yeah. and say thank you so much. We really do appreciate um, your comments. Again, we appreciate you being here uh, to answer some of these questions. And one of the comments uh, someone had sent in to uh, my personal uh, message said, uh, just a chance to ask Dr. Mercer, her, the, the, the messages encourage you to be brave and forthright in your answers. And that's just what you said. Yes. and continue to be as forthright as you always have been because consistency and forthrightness is so important going through this and we count on you for that. So we appreciate it. And it's, it's like medicine. Some are, it's harder to swallow than others, but we know it's good for us in the end. Um, it's hard to live through it. And so I'm gonna start with the first question, which is where we are right now. Uh, the first question comes from Mary, and Mary wants to know, how are decisions, lockdowns, and school closure made? Is there a way that you can explain this about some of the factors that go into that decision? I guess that one's mine, Marva. Yes, so, please. Um, so I, th I think that um, I want to divide what can be done locally and what can be done provincially. So the province has a framework and the province has legislation and where the province has determined that things are closed, I do not have the power to open them. So the provincial framework is there. I can add restrictions, but I can't take away restrictions. So as the provincial framework was in play, and I know for a lot of people, you know, when we were in red, people wanted to know, well, why can't we go to orange? And that was a provincial decision on our data. Um, so, so those are the things that I, I don't control. And those are the things that the province looks at data centrally. And often they, I think they take a provincial view. So they're not necessarily looking at what's happening in North Wellington County, or even in the city of Guelph. Um, they may not even be looking at Wellington Dufferin Guelph as a whole. They may be looking at much broader areas when they make their decisions. And now when it comes to school closures, because I know that that's what's on everybody's mind today and what people have been talking about it a lot in the last 24 hours is school closures and how are those decisions made and who makes them. So the school closure that happened locally um, was a collaborative decision, but, but how did it come about? So if you'd have asked me last uh, week, last Tuesday, um, was I going to close the schools? I would have said no. No, I had no reason to close the schools. Um, but over the course of the last week, and in particular over the last five days, things changed, and, and things changed a lot and rapidly. And so I was watching what was happening over the weekend with the cases coming in and thinking, you know, th things are very different. Um, in one day, we got 100 cases reported in one day. But you can't make a decision based on your feelings, right? Because I knew something felt different. Um, and I knew that we were having a dramatic spike in cases, but you need sort of evidence. So I called into work our data scientists and I asked this individual if he could really look at what is happening in our area so that I could get an understanding. And what we saw over the last week was what we had over, um, actually since Thursday, between Thursday and Monday, we had 300 new cases. We closed more classrooms in one day last week, uh, in one day than we had throughout the entire pandemic. The seven day moving average of cases in our school aged children quadrupled in a, a two week period. It went from 25 to almost 198. The percent positivity in our school aged children, that means the number of tests that are positive um, increased three times in less than a week. 
And in that same period, um, the reproductive number, which is really a number of about if every one person has uh, COVID, how many people do they give it to? Went from 1.08 to 1.37. Now that may not sound like a big increase, but that's the highest it has been since the start of the second wave. And we need a number below one to really end the pandemic. And what really shocked me was the rate of these changes. So in the second wave, we saw a very slow and consistent increase. What we saw over the last week was rapid and a really a straight up curve in terms of the numbers of cases that are happening locally. So now that I had this information, I actually called a meeting of all the directors of education um, on Monday last night, and we talked about it. And we talked about what does this look like? What does it look like in the schools? What, how prepared are you for remote learning? What is happening in our schools? Which schools are able to? And we know that Peel was um, closed today, so the Peel board had some more readiness. We felt that we couldn't close the school um, overnight. Um, that wasn't fair to parents. You know, here it was five, six o'clock on a Monday evening. You can't close a school for a Tuesday. It's not, it's just not fair. We know that, um, I know for many of you, you would think closing on a Wednesday is, is not fair. It didn't give you enough notice. Um, and I acknowledge that it was, it was a tough decision. You don't make these decisions knowing that they're going to be easy and not knowing that lots of people are going to be impacted. Believe me, I can, I know, I get the emails that people are, are, are impacted and, um, the decision and the reason behind the decision is if we add three days to this closure, we may, we may be able to avert a real disaster locally in our schools. And my goal is to keep our children in school. That is the goal here. I want the kids to go to school and I want them to go to school. And I don't want them to keep going out. I don't want to have to keep, oh, you're in school. Now somebody's got COVID and now your whole class is out. We have dozens of classes that are out. Uh, people think not. Uh, they think, oh, I don't know. There's nobody. There's no classes that are at home. That's not true. There are many, many classes, many classes that are out and children that are isolating right now. Mm. So that's how, that's how the decisions are made. And there's only, way, there's only two ways to close a school. I either have to issue an order or I have to issue a letter of instruction. And uh, I, issued an, I issued an order uh, at the, with consultation with the directors of education. Thank you, Nicola. That's very, very, very clear. I'm sure that parents that are listening have a better understanding now. And thank you for that question, Mary. That was a perfect question to start our conversation. We do appreciate that. And the next question, I'll probably ask Anne-Marie and, and give Nicola a bit of a break uh, from that detailed response. Given what we're hearing about the new variants, should we be revising the ethical framework to include essential workers and younger people? And this comes from Craig uh, Emery. That's a great question. I, I'm just having a bit of an emotional reaction to Nicola's comments and I don't wanna cry because that would be embarrassing. Uh, but Dr. Mercer is saving lives um, and she's saving our young people's lives. So man, that is fabulous leadership when you do that out front on your own courageously before other people do it. Uh, and I'm just very proud of that. Thank you, Dr. Mercer. Um, what was the question again, Marva? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It's given what we're hearing about the new variants, should we be revising the ethical framework to include essential workers and younger people? Um, and I imagine that this has to do with the vaccines. Right, so um, I think there's flexibility, but unfortunately I'm gonna hand that back to Nicola because uh, my sense is that that, that may happen, but I'm, I'm not sitting at any provincial tables. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And really it's a question that's born out of vaccine scarcity. If, if we had tons of vaccine, th this wouldn't be an issue, right? We would just be vaccinating everybody as quickly as we can, but because we don't actually have enough to go around right now, I mean, it's coming. We've been hearing that for a long time, but it's not here. So because we don't have enough for everybody who wants it right now, there's sort of a, a rationing and there's sort of a, 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 a system of prioritization. And that prioritization was not created locally. It was actually created by the province. Um, there's a very slight amount of wiggle room, but really the prioritization is a framework. 
framework and essential workers are on that framework. They're just not at the beginning of phase two. And as we continue to work our way through phase two, we will end up um, uh, immunizing our essential workers. Um, and it's a great question because I think it's one that's going to be asked long after the pandemic is over too. It's not just now mm -hmm. as, as was, did we get it right? But all I can tell you is the people who created the framework put their heart and soul into to creating it. Um, they did so with their best knowledge that they can, but did they get it right is, is what we will we'll have to find out over time. This is the same reason for the first vac vaccine and the length of time between the first and the second that you're speaking of the scarcity. That's yeah. another one of the questions that I'm building into. Yeah, so so that's also what happened. So I know a lot of people are really angry about that. They they wanted their second dose. I I you know I signed up for the first one, and you told me, and I was expecting the second one at at the at the you know twenty one to twenty eight day mark. Um, what I can tell you though is that yeah, if we had lots of vaccine, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing, but we don't. Mm -hmm. And so there is the question: Should some people get two doses and others get none and potentially die, mm -hmm. or should we spread it out? because we know that one dose will prevent people from dying. We know that 100%. We know that one dose prevent people from dying. It won't necessarily prevent everybody from having symptoms and maybe having mild symptoms, but it prevents deaths, it prevents hospitalization. So the decision on the part, and I think it's the right decision in vaccine scarcity, is to ensure that we protect the most number of people, the fastest, and everybody will get their second dose mm -hmm. when we have more vaccine, yes. There's, there's also evolving uh, evidence, at least with the messenger RNA vaccines, that they are highly protective at preventing uh, um, uh, COVID-19 infection right up to six months. Uh, so that's sound and that's based on real live data with millions of vaccinated uh, people in countries mm -hmm. that are at that point. So, so I also agree that the distance of four months in between shots is a, an extremely wise one. And it may change when we are not in a vaccine scarce situation, but it was so the right decision to make for our country at this time. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Cause that's a big question and I'm sure it will come up in all the questions that have come in. And uh, Helen, Folks are talking about hitting a, a, a pandemic wall. They've done the tried the self care and the outdoor activities, and now they're feeling less comfortable less, 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 in motivating themselves uh, to really have a chance. Have a chance. I'm hearing some feedback, so I might have to take off my headset and see what happens. Oh, we're good now. Uh, so, Helen, uh, can you comment on how people can? motivate themselves now uh, with this and, and, and sort of uh, try to allay that feeling of depression and, and sadness and anxiety. Sure. Um, we hear this all the time in terms of people hitting the pandemic wall. And I mean, let's be honest, it's been absolutely bruising for the past 13 months. Uh, you know, people are surviving right now. They're not thriving be just because of the conditions of, of the pandemic. Uh, the restrictions that are required to keep us all safe are the things that uh, we need actually to feel connected, to feel supported. Uh, so it, you know, the restrictions are incredibly important and they're a sacrifice uh, for us, but that sacrifice is really about keeping each of us safe and our families. Uh, and it's certainly a massive sacrifice. We know that. Um, and but we have to keep going. We know that. Uh, and it's really important. Uh, and people will hit the wall. And I say hit the wall because that's going to feel different to people at different times. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly there's a couple things that I would suggest. First of all, give yourself credit for everything that you are doing. Sometimes we lose track of that because we can focus on the things that we can't do or that we can't see. Uh, and if you can focus on one or two things a day and, you know, likely you'll feel a, a better sense of accomplishment and focus on the things that you are doing, you can certainly find joy in the little things uh, in life. And right now, the little things, uh, simple acts of kindness and connection are really, really meaningful. And it's important to find that joy right now as much as possible. Um, I'm really pleased that in this third wave, we're moving into the warmer weather. Uh, today was a great example. It was an absolutely gorgeous day today. That weather absolutely boosts your mood. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things that you can do outside while still maintaining public health guidelines, which is so important right now. 
Um, I would also say it's really important that we treat ourselves with a lot of compassion. You know, generally as a rule, we have a lot of compassion and understanding for other people and we give each other uh, a lot of room, but we don't uh, sometimes afford that to ourselves. Uh, we're living under really tough conditions that even though these measures are so necessary, uh, it's tough and it's really hard on all of us. We need to acknowledge that and give ourselves lots of room. It's okay to feel the angry anger we've talked about, to feel that anxiety, to feel that worry. That is completely normalized. Mm -hmm. So really give yourself a break on that. Uh, and then of course, balancing things. So you're, you know, taking care of your own self-care needs and those around you. And of course, eating well, sleeping well, drinking lots of water, in a heightened time of stress, those things I know are so basic, but they are so important. Mm -hmm. And of course, most of all, reach out. If you're hitting that wall, the things that you normally do that aren't working, it's really time to reach out and connect with someone um, in a more formal way and try to access those supports and try some things different. Thank you, Helen. That's great. Very great advice and really thorough. So we have about 100 questions that we're going to try to get through as many as possible. We won't get there for 100 for sure. So I'm just going to I'm going to shrink down some of the, the questions um, very quickly. And if there's anything that we can um, answer uh, rapidly, that would be really awesome. One question is quite long, but it talks about Pregnancy. Is there any research about impact on mother, impact on baby if mother gets COVID-19 while pregnant? Uh, yes, there is. Sorry, Nicola, I'll answer that. Uh, there yeah. is evidence uh, that COVID-19 has worse outcomes in uh, pregnant women. Uh, worse outcomes for her during pregnancy, worse outcomes uh, for the pregnancy in general, premature labor, uh, much higher risk of serious illness and death. And because of that higher risk, it is recommended that all pregnant people get vaccinated. The risk of COVID-19 far outweighs the risk of the vaccine. Great, thank you. And over to you again, Helen, um, uh, about what can we do to protect uh, the mental health of our children during these difficult times, especially when schools are closed? Uh, great question. And what I would say is that, you know, we've heard from uh, Dr. Mercer uh, why it was so important to keep schools closed. And that is so important to protect our kids. Uh, we know that our kids can't be in school right now. And as tough as that is, it's tough on kids and it's tough on the parents. We know that's just a reality. Uh, and that's something, you know, keeping our kids physically safe while mentally uh, supporting their wellness is so, uh, it's a hard balance right now, but it's absolutely essential for us to do that. So I think there's a few things uh, that are really important. First of all, be honest with your kids. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what age your kid or your children are. You can be, uh, you can share age appropriate information with them. Uh, and sometimes less is more. We don't have to give them every bit of detail because that can be quite overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But some basic core information and then let them ask questions is really important. Uh, I think really keeping that conversation open. It's not one of these one and done conversations. It's going to be one of those daily or weekly conversations that you're really exploring with your child. Uh, mm -hmm. what they're struggling with, what's working for them, what are the things that they're enjoying, what are the things that they're missing, and to try and find uh, ways to bridge the gap in terms of the things that they're missing. There are many ways that you can connect with people, for example, their peer group, uh, grandparents, uh, good friends of the family, that we aren't able to all be together right now. There are some basic things like FaceTime, text, old-fashioned phone calls, and old-fashioned letter writing. Uh, you know, writing letters to grandparents, for example, is a great activity uh, for your child to do. And again, age appropriate, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is to, to try different things. There's all kinds of things that you can do online uh, or activities. Uh, and again, with the warmer weather, you can do some of those things outside. Um, research a few things, uh, look it up with your child, plan for a different uh, thing that to do every weekend or to try something. Uh, and make a game out of it, have some fun with it. Uh, and the other thing which I always think is so important is to find ways to support other people that are struggling, uh, yeah. whether that's writing postcards to people in long-term care home, whether that's sending uh, messages of care and support to people that are not well, there's many things that we can do to support our community and have your child do that. It's also mm -hmm. a way for them to practice their perspective and gratitude. Thank you, Helen. And the next question, why is AstraZeneca less effective? 
I think that's your nickel at your answer, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I, let's, I want to rephrase that. Is it less effective? Um, yes. First of all, it's a totally different vaccine. It's a viral vector mm -hmm. vaccine. It's not an mm -hmm. mRNA vaccine. If we'd have had AstraZeneca first, and if it was our only vaccine, we'd be jumping up and down with joy because mm -hmm. it is 100% effective at preventing severe, severe disease, hospitalization, and death. That's what we've seen. Um, but when we do compare it to the mRNA vaccine, it is its efficacy, which is not the same as effectiveness. Its efficacy is slightly lower, but it is still a very good vaccine. We know it is because if you look at countries like UK who distributed millions and millions of doses of it, you can see that their rates of disease and they're getting out of the pandemic fine too. So, so from an effectiveness perspective, it's a very good vaccine. I wish my flu shots were as good as this one is. Okay, great to hear. And the next question, thank you for that. I'm hearing that there are time slots going on field for vaccines. Why is that? Oh, can I get this one? Yes, you yeah. can. Okay. <laughs> Henry won't wrestle you for this one, not this one. <laughs> uh, no, uh, not in Guelph. We have, we fill all of our spots every week. So yes. this is this is really specifically um, probably more of a Peel Toronto issue, and there's pro it's probably multifactorial about people getting to the clinics. Um, are they able to navigate the technology? Can do they have transportation? Um, can they, you know, sometimes the 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 places are far from the parking lot, and the place is far from each other. There's there's probably lots and lots of reasons, probably language barriers potentially for the Toronto population. But locally, I can tell you that uh, we. Uh, we actually try to only open up our bookings about two weeks because we find we, we fill up 100% of the time we mm -hmm. fill our clinics. And if they were to give me a little bit more vaccine, I'm sure I would be able to find people who would want that vaccine. Well, that's great. Thank you for that. Again, we're getting information from all over, right? And some of the information is accurate, some of it isn't. So having this kind of forum to answer some of those questions is, is so important. Uh, I think folks didn't have any idea that this you're hearing it from somewhere else. It's another jurisdiction and not necessarily here. So thank you for that. Um, is it safe to send three-year-olds to daycare in Guelph? The daycares are still open. Um, can you comment on that? Um, near Nicola? Nicola? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. And we will take that. <laughs> and so, no, go ahead, Nicola. Yeah. Okay, all right. I just don't wanna keep jumping in, Emery. So uh, yeah. uh, is I'm it safe? Yes, madly online here. Okay, our, our, our daycares, are safe. What I can tell you is, is that uh, that little children seem to not transmit the disease as much. It's probably to do with their very small breath rate or tidal volume, we would call that, but they don't seem to be really good vectors between both um, adults and themselves or between each other. Um, we do find cases in young children. They usually get it at home and we have sent children home daycares. We do have some daycares closed, um, but in terms of outbreaks and daycares, it's been really quite, quite remarkably low. Um, in saying that, I do believe that there will be a vaccine someday for children, as well as we will be vaccinating daycare workers. But uh, for parents who send their children to daycare, uh, um, there are very good measures in place to protect your child. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nicola. Uh, Emery, uh, organizations yes. are planning to bring staff back to work in the summer under the premise that most will be able to have access to at least the first dose of vaccine. Uh, can you comment on this approach? Um, and I know Dr. Mercer spoke earlier that um, two doses uh, is not required. And you mentioned that as well. You know, the four months that we have to wait is working out fine. This person is concerned about um, mid-fall being the second. And given the, the current time frame, what are some of the things that they should work on? And should they be worried uh, that they won't have the second vaccine by the fall? Um, so I think the timing of the second uh, dose remains to be seen in terms of how long it will take before everyone in our unit or in the province has received the second dose. And it varies from unit to unit. We are way ahead of the game in our unit, thanks to Dr. Mercer. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's unwise for organizations to say, like universities, to say that they will open up in September. They can always take that back. Mm -hmm. It may be a bit of hopeful thinking, uh, but they're thinking ahead and and um, it is important for us to try to get back to normal as quickly as possible. I think they'll reverse that decision if the, if the numbers show us it's not a wise decision. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And so for the second vaccine, the follow-up question is those with immuno, immunocompromised um, diseases, di uh, diabetic, chronic lung disease, et cetera, will they receive the second dose um, sooner than others? Can I answer that, Nicola? Yeah, sure. Uh, just to give you a rest. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that as soon as there is not vaccine scarcity, that the list of individuals who will get their vaccine earlier, sooner than later, will expand. For yes. now, the list is very short. I don't know if you want to expand on, on who's on that list right now, but the fact that a list exists means that those people that are leading this have it on their radar that some folks probably shouldn't wait for the four months. Thank you for that. And while Nicola rests a little bit after Anne-Marie's answered that question so beautifully, let me just read a couple of comments that has come through for all of you and, and for Dr. Mercer especially as well. Uh, from Kate Creary, thank you for all your incredible leadership during this pandemic. So grateful. That's one. And the other is thank you, Dr. Mercer, for the tremendous work and the public health team uh, that the public health team have done to ensure the efficient vaccination of people living in this region. And I just want to share that with you because I think it's important to for these question comments coming in. Susan Wiley um, asked whether uh, public health has information on their website about who can pre-register for, for vaccines, but for phase two, it's a larger group. Inside that group, who's currently getting appointments to get vaccinated? And that's to you, Nicola. Uh, that's a, gr a great question. So currently, um, we are inviting everybody uh, who is 65 years in age and over. That's that's a group. So if people, we've immunized a lot of them. A lot of these people already have appointments. But if you register today, um, you would be invited the next day to book an appointment. It is our intention at the end of this week to follow up with everybody over the age of 60. So within and um, up by the week of April 19th, I'm hoping everybody in the area is ho who's over the age of 60. Obviously, anybody who's in phase one is still eligible. So if you mm -hmm. weren't sure in phase one, you're a healthcare worker, or you were nervous and an essential caregiver, um, you can still get it. Absolutely. Please, please register if you've changed your mind. We are also looking at people with health conditions. So it was divided into a highest high and at risk health conditions. And we're working with our family health teams to try and help identify those people to help get them vaccinated. And of course, there's a very big bucket of essential caregivers and or sorry, essential caregivers, as well as essential workers. The essential mm. workers right now have not, as part of the framework, they're sort of towards the end of phase two as per the provincial uh, guidance. Um, and But I recognize, and I think every medical officer of health does that, that these are people at risk. So in our area, we, in public health, we're looking at neighborhoods at risk where neighborhoods have low vaccination rate where communities have low vaccination rates and high numbers of cases. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to invite them preferentially on our, if they're registered for a vaccine or we're going to be going into those neighborhoods with pop-up clinics to try great. and target at-risk populations. Thank you, that's great, that's great. Uh, let me just ask uh, Helen, where can I get cognitive behavior therapy in Guelph on, who, on OHIP? A great question. So I would, the first stop I would ask is if uh, you are uh, employed and check with your benefit provider. Uh, if you have benefits, that's always the first stop. Uh, and many benefit providers uh, provide CBT, which is uh, kind of a standard tool in our therapy kit. Uh, the other thing is uh, family counseling and support services uh, and all the counseling providers in Waterloo Region, there's six providers, all provide uh, CBT as well. And they have a sliding scale on mm. which they can, um, uh, for costs, uh, depending on your income. Uh, the other thing is there is a lot of online services right now uh, that have really been created through the pandemic. Many of those services are free. Uh, one such program is called Bounce Back. So bounceback.ca, you'll see uh, is a very goal-focused CBT program where you pick a goal and work through the program with a workbook, online workbook, as well as a phone coach. Those are mm. uh, some really great outcomes of that program. There's Mind Beacon. There's all kinds of apps uh, that are CBT. If you go to uh, a website that CMHA sponsors called Here for Help, .ca. What you'll see on that website that we've created specifically for the pandemic is a whole list of uh, resources that are available online. 
all of those resources are free uh, mm -hmm. and you can tap into them as well. And of course, in if uh, you're not sure, call your family doctor's office as well. Your family doctor's always a great resource. And then of course we have HERE 24 seven, one eight four four HERE 247 for uh, at any time of the day or night if people want to be connected to services. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. That's great and very thorough. Uh, quick question, Emery. Uh, my wife is under cancer treatment and we have vaccination appointment on April 17th. However, they've read an article which said that for cancer patients, it is better that they get their second dose in three to four weeks time. Would that happen? Uh, they happen to be in Waterloo. Uh, so I can answer that question for, uh, for Guelph. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Nicola, this does apply to other units, uh, that you are on the small list of folks who will get your vaccine uh, much earlier uh, than the four month mark. Uh, so we have been asked uh, as primary care physicians to find our patients who are on cancer treatment uh, and, and um, give them a, a a piece of paper, a, a, a letter, so to speak, that is uh, pre-populated uh, and given to us by public health uh, to allow public health to allow them to book an earlier appointment for their second vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. We want to make sure that, especially if they're having chemotherapy, immunotherapy, that they get their, their second dose. And sometimes you have to work it around courses of, of chemo or immunotherapy. So we're quite flexible. And for anybody who's listening who had their shot but didn't get the second appointment, we're actually calling people to try and make sure that you get your second appointment. So for people on that list who are who have a cancer treatment, yes, you will you will get your second dose earlier. That's great. And I, I'm, I'm going to answer this question. Huh, I'm not the expert here. Uh, someone was talking about 80 plus, And I recall that you said earlier, if folks are 80 plus, for example, or they missed getting their appointment for whatever reason, they would be on the list of people that they can still call and make an appointment and get their vaccine. They can call and make an appointment or they can, if they have a, a somebody who can help them register online, it doesn't matter. We will vaccinate them. Uh, right now, over 90% of our community of over the age of 80 is, is vaccinated. But, you know, if we can make it 100%, that's good. Wonderful. I answered one question. Yeah. Well, that was because I heard the answer beforehand. <laughs> that's great. Has there been any thought as to vaccinating the younger generation who are working in service jobs and manufacturing instead of going by age? This is, appears to be where the big outbreaks are happening now. This is from Pauline Horn. Nicola? You were on me. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is a this is a really um, a big question, uh, and I think if if we didn't have vaccine scarcity, this would not be the question. This would be an absolute. Oh yes, we must go to immunize people who cannot work remotely. Um, I, I think that uh, it's a very much a hot topic at the provincial level as we try to understand how do we protect workers who cannot uh, work remotely because it's it's really a very it's, it's an important por portion of our workforce that really right now we are seeing lots of cases. So right now at this moment in time, especially if you're young, um, there isn't um, there isn't vaccine right now for you, but you are on the list for phase two. And if you cannot, if you are an essential worker and you cannot work remotely uh, or you please register on our website because we do want to vaccinate you and you will be vaccinated ahead of those who are able to work uh, remotely. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Anne-Marie? Nope. Wonderful. Um, someone wants to know how to support a son or daughter who refuses the vaccine. What would your suggestion be, Anne-Marie? Anne -Marie. Oh, you want me to answer that? Yes, please. Um, I, I think if it's a young uh, son or daughter, I had this conversation with a patient today. Um, where they're 30 uh, year old, 20 year old children, so to speak, um, are refusing vaccination. They have time. Uh, so they, they are not going to be called up for vaccination um, in phase two. They will be called up in phase three. By phase three, I think we're going to see such a dramatic drop in the number of new cases that it will be very hard for them not to be vaccinated. We're also going to see the variants um, continue to wreak havoc with younger age groups. And so 
a little bit of fear might encourage people to be vaccinated. Um, I, I don't believe in, um, in uh, pushing people or judging people who are vaccine afraid, vaccine hesitant or vaccine adverse. Give them time, give mm. them the correct information and then leave it there. People are much better off making decisions on their own than being pressured to make decisions. Thank you for that. I would also add, Marva, just to explore what some of that anxiety and fear is about. Some mm -hmm. of it might be around misinformation, which you can correct, mm -hmm. and other is just some of that unknown, right? And just mm -hmm. sitting with the person exploring some of that and having them name it, it may also help them work through it. Wonderful. And the next question is actually for you, Helen. Uh, someone's father is in retirement home in Perth County. And when, lo when lockdown comes into effect, the home does not allow any vis visitors at all. Uh, they aren't even allowed window visits and it really negatively affects the father and his mental health well being. What can I do to support and advocate for him is a question from Colleen. Yeah, we hear this quite often, uh, and it's one of the most heartbreaking consequences that we have of the pandemic. Uh, it's It's been heartening to see the vaccination rates in long-term care and retirement homes uh, go up and be so strong and see those outbreaks uh, lessen and lessen and lessen. So that's the good news, and that will only continue the more the population uh, becomes vaccinated. But again, we're in that, that spot right now where we're not quite there. Um, if the home doesn't even allow window visits, I really don't think there's a whole lot that you can do other than um, old fashioned phone calls um, mm. uh, and also mailing um, packages, you know, sending cards, sending letters in the mail, all of that is still very much allowed. I think the other thing that many homes are doing and are trying to be as creative as possible is using uh, iPads to FaceTime family members. Mm -hmm. So that would be something that I would certainly contact the home and say, is there anybody uh, that could facilitate, facilitate a FaceTime uh, a request uh, through a use of an iPad? Homes are very good about doing that usually. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. That's great. Uh, someone said, this is a comment to everyone that's listening. If anyone is on the fence about getting the AstraZeneca vaccine via pharmacy, this person says, do it in caps. I got my first dose today and can't say enough good stuff about the process. Um, so Erica, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, as well, uh, Sue has written, we so very much appreciate Nicola's courage and determination to do what is needed. So sharing that with you, Nicola. Um, and someone sent this in anon anonymously. Uh, Wellington Dufferin Guelph is part of the 13 health units identified today as hotspots and to receive more vaccines. Why were we chosen and to what categories will these be allocated? Dr. Mercer. Well, that, that's great news. I, I hadn't heard that. So um, so um, anyways, that's that's lovely. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. It's one of the benefits of coming on this talk. Um, what I, what, yeah, what I can say is that um, we have had uh, 7,000 doses of Pfizer a week um, for a few weeks, and that's all my allotment is for all of um, April. So I'm really hoping that that's true. Um, and uh, my Moderna vaccine supply has been a little bit unpredictable. I do believe though, that if you're talking possibly about AstraZeneca, that might be the vaccine that we're talking about, because I, I've, which goes to pharmacies um, or to primary care. So it actually doesn't go to the health unit. So it's not delivered through our, our mass immunization mm -hmm. clinic. So that's a little bit of a, a difference. And so without knowing which uh, vaccine you're talking about, but we do have um, hotspots communities and probably um, it's no probably no surprise as to uh, those parts of the province which have a higher density in particular and if you have communities where you have a lot of essential workers people who cannot um, uh, work remotely um, especially if they live in crowded conditions and high-rise apartments in uh, you know the, with multi-generational families those are all the sort of the criteria that lead to a spread of COVID and result in hotspots across the province. Thank you for your response to that. So I'm glad that we could bring you some good news. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Uh, it... Marva, can yes, I answer one question that I'm- Absolutely. Because uh, I've heard it several times uh, mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to answer the questions in the chat. Um, people are talking about millions of vaccines sitting in freezers unused. Mm -hmm. You can't take the, the vaccine that's been delivered to you and immediately give it to hundreds of thousands of people. 
Thank goodness we have the storage capacity. It's sitting there ready for distribution. And the infrastructure for mass vaccination clinics is more than ready across the province. Of course, some doses are going to sit in a freezer before they're given, but that doesn't mean there isn't a great plan in place to give them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Helen, can you comment on how parents can access mental health support for themselves and their kids? Uh, the person is reaching out to different areas to get some support for the last three to six months and, and options for struggling families. Sure. So um, there's lots of different ways. Uh, the simplest way, is certainly here in Guelph, Wellington, is to uh, call here 24 7. So that's 1 844 here 24 7. That service is available at all times, literally 24 7. So we'll be able to talk with the parent, uh, look at what the concerns are, and then make a determination around risk uh, and then uh, re respond accordingly. Uh, we also know that there's lots of services and supports available within school boards. So if your child is in school, there might be a child and youth worker or a social worker connected to the school that you can access. We know that our counseling providers provide amazing uh, services to kids and families as well. And of course, our family doctor's office also sees uh, families and parents that are struggling as well. Um, over in Waterloo Region, Front Door is uh, the access point to children's mental health as well. And again, they're one-stop shopping uh, that you can call the Front Door service and access their help. When in doubt, and I know I've given you lots of suggestions there, when in doubt, and we want to make it really simple for people, here 24-7 is your best bet. Uh, we have trained staff working literally around the clock, and they can walk you through what your concerns are, whether you're a parent, an adult, a child, a senior, we'll talk to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for Martha. that. Martha. And Emery, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, so I'm just seeing a, a lot of questions that are on along the same lines. Yes. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, right now, uh, we believe that there may be an associated risk between the AstraZeneca vaccine in people under 55 and a very rare um, mm -hmm. uh, blood clot in the brain. Uh, I think we'll hear more about this in the coming days, but that risk is likely one in a million, which is extremely rare. And and the risk of uh, dire consequences from COVID-19 is much higher. So the, the, um, the country did reset guidelines to say under uh, 55, no AstraZeneca vaccine until this is more clear, but over 55, the vaccine is safe. Um, do you agree with that, Nicola? I haven't read the news today and sometimes I'm out of date because I didn't get a chance to read. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. This new, this this bad thing that happens, which we call VIPIT, we always have to have a name for these things, yeah. um, yeah. is um, we do believe it's associated with, in particular with women under the age of 55. So, I mean, there's lots of research being done on as to why that might be. It is very rare, but until they allow us to give it to uh, people under the age of 55, which many countries have done, many countries, including UK, uh, we will, we're limited to age 55 and over. Um, for this particular vaccine. Thank you. We're doing great. We've answered 41 questions. So awesome. that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. This is a long one. Um, I can feel this person's pain. And certainly there are a lot of pains on here as we respond to your question. We're all in this together. And we really are, are you know, our empathy and our hearts go right out to you. This person says, as Shannon says, I closed my personal service business as ordered. Even though I teach one person at a time, fully masked and socially distanced. But my mental health is really beginning to suffer when I drive past a mall and see a full parking lot and every retail store in our town is open. With the seriousness of COVID and the variants, why are only certain non-essential businesses closed? I can't understand the logic that my teenage son isn't going to class in person, but can go to a mall. Please help me understand. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Mercer to start and then everybody else can jump in. Yeah, you know, this, this is a, a totally valid question and, and one that I've asked in my own heart too, because sometimes we see things that, that just don't make sense, but the, and it, it hurts people, like people who have lives and businesses that aren't able to, to be open. The, the rules 
are made centrally by the province. And, and I want to say, though, clearly, though, that I think they really are trying to do the right thing. Like, I, I, I think that they are trying to balance the economy with the disease. But sometimes I don't think they always get it right. And, uh, and, and in this particular case, um, I do think that the, you know, the malls having being open and, and, and being encouraging people to gather is not in people's best interest. Uh, so uh, in that case, and for you, thank you very much, first of all, for closing your business, for doing the right thing. Uh, I, my heart goes out to everybody who's, who's been so hurt by this yeah. pandemic. I, I just want this to be over. I want you to get your vaccine. I want your clients to get your vaccine. I want you to get back to work. I, I, I cannot say that anything more than that. I, I, I can't justify why, why some things just seem so, so wrong. And I think recently before you start, Emery, with the Yorkdale, um, that, that went viral where the mall was full. And indeed we see that a fair bit. So can fully understand that. Emery and then Helen. Yeah, so I, um, I'm going to put it out there, along with a lot of ed other people in the medical community. Uh, I believe we should be in a tighter lockdown situation right now. I think it's dangerous to be at the malls. I think we should be right back to where we were last March. Uh, that might not be a popular thing for me to say, uh, but these variants are very dangerous and we are so close to protecting everyone with a vaccine. We should not be messing around with this right now. Good question. Helen? The only other thing I would add in, um, and certainly our, uh, the question is really valid and those feelings are, are really legitimate. Uh, and there's a lot of raw pain and, uh, and suffering that people are experiencing right now. The other thing that we've heard a lot about through the pandemic is a new term called pangry. So pangry oh, yes. refers, <laughs> refers to people that are angry during the pandemic uh, with people that are not following public health guidelines. So every, you know, most of the population are doing the right thing, closing your business, uh, staying six feet apart, not having your family and friends over, not going to places that you know you're not allowed to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, other people are doing those things and are breaking the rules. And that's creating this, this a lot of anger and a lot of unrest in the community. Uh, and this has coined this term called pangry. So it's something for all of us to be aware of uh, and to really focus on what we can do. Uh, as Nicholas said, it's really important that each of us does the right thing. It's hard sometimes because that comes with sacrifice and that comes with a lot of consequences. And even though we know hope is on the horizon and we've got that you know, six to eight window, uh, week window, it's still a long time for people. Um, to have to endure these consequences. So be aware of those feelings, talk about them, focus on what you can control. There's a lot mm -hmm. in our world right now that we can't control, but certainly each one of us doing the right thing is going to help uh, calm the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Dr. Mercer, can you give us some idea in general terms regarding where the drastic increases over the last few days have come from? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So um, it, it's really being driven by the variants. And sometimes, and these variants are, are highly infectious. Well, we used to say that if you were in a room with somebody for more than 15 minutes, that you could potentially um, get the disease, especially if you were not masked. We mm -hmm. now know that it's it's cumulative. It, it could actually be just a few minutes. So you know how you stop in the hallway and you have a little, what I call a coffee chat, and you may be a little closer to than six feet. Maybe you're drinking a coffee, so you have your mask off. That's all it takes. These new variants are highly infectious. So people get it. Uh, they and the other thing what we're seeing is that people probably pass it along to somebody quicker. So they either have a higher viral load or they're incubating faster. So we see it spreading person to person much faster than we did with the wild one or which is or the original one, uh, which, which came out. So, so these are all things that are normal in viruses. Viruses want to survive. They want to, you know, they want to spread. And so this is what happens in it with all viral uh, tech does this, but this is really why we're seeing that and why mm -hmm. it went. We were about 60% now and every country that you saw that as soon as you hit about 30, 40%, it, the curve goes straight up. So right now, locally, we're about 60% of our samples are variants. 
Wow. 60% of our samples are variants. Variants. Yeah. Wow. Huge reason why we need to heed um, public health's warning and the scientists' warning. Uh, Dr. Mercer, um, as you uh, finish that question, finish responding, uh, there's a comment to you that says, we have your back, Dr. Mercer. Your guidance has held us in good hands to date. Thank you. So just wanted to read that to you. Uh, and this other question uh, to you, Henry, uh, with the work that you've done on Facebook to respond and to provide clear, concise information to people. Again, this is sort of a heartbreaker. They all are. My 36-year-old son has been totally taken in by the conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and has broken contact with the rest of the family. It brings us such sorrow. We're concerned about his wife and their marriage, and uh, but we do not know how to reach him. And they said, I know we're not alone in this struggle. Do we just wait this out and hope for the best? Um, Helen, you can probably help with this answer too. I think waiting it out is important. Um, it's extremely painful. I can't even imagine. Um, my philosophy is I will not um, do anything to uh, harm my personal relationships. And that includes... Um, uh, getting upset with a person who doesn't agree with vaccines. Mm -hmm. I'm about to post tomorrow night, if I'm, if I'm feeling energetic, uh, about um, uh, conspiracy theories and how to um, determine if what you're reading is actually conspiracy uh, or is it truth. So there are some new guidelines that can help people with that. Um, and, you know, if you read the post, it might be helpful to discuss that uh, with your son. Uh, but this is a really tough, tough situation. I, I would totally agree, Anne-Marie. I think uh, in these times, it, there's a natural gut instinct to want to come on really strong to that person and try to yep. convince them and, you know, get in their face and give them the facts. They're not open to it. Their, their mind is closed. Their heart is closed. Uh, and let's hope that that's a temporary thing in response to such extreme and extenuating circumstances right now. Yeah. What I would say is do your very best to maintain any level of contact in the yeah. most non-judgmental, supportive way possible so that at least that uh, potential bridge is there for that person to come back. And when the time is right, um, hopefully that opportunity is there to help bring them back. Um, the other thing I have recognized when I'm speaking to patients in my practice who are um, tied up in conspiracy theories, uh, that comes from a place of deep, deep fear. Yes. Uh, it's all fear based. Uh, and I have a much better time of accepting someone's point of view when I remind myself that it's coming from a place of fear. It's, that actually draws out my compassion and empathy. Um, and so maybe remembering that is, is very important. Thank you for that. I'm going to try for us to answer about five or six questions within the last seven minutes of what we have left. So this is sort of rapid fire. Um, someone asked a question, do you have any estimated timeline when those in phase two may receive a vaccination? And also, is there any talk of moving teachers up to be vaccinated? Dr. Mercer, I'll give that one to you. Uh, we're already in phase two. Yay. We're, um, I yes. would guesstimate that we're about the halfway mark. Uh, so if I, I'm hoping that, and that would mean that teachers are in phase two, teachers will get vaccinated. I think they're the first part of the essential workers. Um, uh, likely there'll be a lot of people in that category. So I, I, I'm hoping that we will take probably almost all of May uh, to uh, immunize uh, the, in those individuals. And who knows, maybe we'll get more vaccine and then uh, we'll go a yes. little faster. That's great. Thank you. And I'm just going to throw all of these out. Is there a guideline yeah. for surgery backlog due to COVID? For what? Sorry, Marva? For surgery backlog due to COVID. Is there a guideline? I think that really depends uh, from region to region and hospital to hospital. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this, the uh, um, chief medical officers, the chief of staff and the um, CEO of hospitals uh, are, I think, making decisions uh, based on their own um, uh, circumstances. It really does vary and it varies from hotspot to non-hotspot as well. Mm -hmm. Lo locally, we haven't been as bad as some areas like no. the, the Toronto Peel yeah. areas have been really hard hit. Yeah. And the follow-up question, sorry, is why is Orangeville have fewer, um, have fewer clinics? Why does, or proportionally, 
does Orangeville have fewer clinics? Dr. Mercer? I'm not so sure that, that Orangeville does. Orangeville has larger clinics um, than some of our other areas. So we try to move more people through on one day. Um, we certainly are, do look at Orangeville in terms of, um, it's a smaller population. So we get vaccine and we, Orangeville, or they should say the county definitely will get less vaccine proportionate to the population. Mm -hmm. um, and interesting you say that because um, we already have plans to add uh, some clinics in Orangeville uh, next week. Uh, they usually fill up fast when we do, but uh, so there's, if you're from Orangeville and you're listening, uh, keep an eye on the website because there, there will be more um, clinics That's coming. coming. That's great. Helen, um, where's the biggest miscommunication between federal and provincial decisions and public health between maybe between you and, and Dr. Mercer? Sorry, where's the biggest? That miscommunication between the federal provincial government decisions and then public health. Maybe Nicola can start and you can finish or whomever wants to jump in with this one. It's a tough one. Well, I mean, I think anytime you're talking about politicians and they always want to position themselves in, in the best light. So the, the federal government's role is to procure um, and distribute to the provinces. And then the province's role is to, is to distribute to uh, the, the public health units who actually deliver the vaccine. So everyone, actually tries to make themselves look as good as they can. So whether you're on procuring or distributing, you want people to know that you've got lots and you're doing a great job at that. And, and the provinces want to everybody to know they have a great plan to roll it out. And then as those of us in public health have to prove that we have a great plan because we're the ones who are actually um, at the end of the, the day with the vaccine in our freezers and are actually delivering the vaccine. So I, I think it's a little bit political, but I, I believe that every po politician, every leader wants the same thing. We want this pandemic mm. over and they want to try and get vaccine in people's arms. That's their goal. Yes. And I think I can say this, that um, certainly if you're an elected official, you're not only thinking about what's in the best interest, but you're thinking about constituents and how they're going to react. What is the newspaper going to say the next day? And when you are in the business of uh, a medical professional and especially providing leadership in this area, you have to think about the lives that are going to be impacted. And that's your focus and, and not necessarily what it might look like. And so it's a tough place for um, politicians to be in. And that's um, and sometimes that's understandable. And sometimes it comes in conflict with uh, something like a pandemic pandemic, you're going to find lots and lots of, uh, of different issues. Uh, this is not a question that we're uh, in mental health, we're putting a lot of pressure right now on both the yes. and provincial government, uh, because our funding is absolutely not sufficient to meet the needs of our community, especially in a global yes. pandemic. So yes. we've created a new campaign called Everything is Not Okay. So you can find it on our website, everythingisnotokay.ca. Mm -hmm. It's provincially supported by uh, four main hospitals and three provincial associations. And we are going to demand action from the government that they meet the uh, basic mental health and addictions needs of people across our community, which is solely lacking 3,535 people waiting for care right now in Waterloo and Guelph Wellington, which is mm -hmm. totally unacceptable. So we've got the main, we got the heat on right now with our mm -hmm. federal provincial uh, politicians to help us out. I think that's great. And mental health has always been underfunded for it so really many is. years. Yeah. And now we know the importance of um, mental health uh, yeah. for good physical health. So that's yeah. great. Good luck with that, Helen. Uh, not a question, but a person wanted to express their appreciation for everything you all do in these unprecedented, very stressful times. And they say, I trust your leadership and I thank you. So wonderful leaders, uh, congratulations and all of that. Uh, someone mentioned that they were looking at the data for Wellington Public Health and noticed that there's a significant rise in positive cases for under 50. Are you able to open up vaccinations regardless? And I know that we have um, um, answered that to some degree previously, but maybe we can reinforce. The person is asking, because in all likelihood, younger people are being impacted and they're at work and moving around more. And they thank you for the leadership and providing comfort as well in asking that question. So under 50 with the new variant, is there any way of opening that up? Emery? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was writing a, a response. Nicola, did you get <laughs> Nicola. I, I'll take that. Um, yeah. yeah, I wish with all my heart that I had enough vaccine that I could start immunizing um, essential workers, yeah. people in our workplaces that have been so hard hit. I, I wish that I, I don't have the vaccine. No one in Ontario does. We just don't have enough vaccine. And I hope that I wake up tomorrow and something is different. Um, and I know it's coming. So please continue with the public health measures. They will protect you. Wear a mask. The best mask is whatever one is most comfortable for you and at least two layers. Wear it. Wear a, a shield as well. Keep your hands clean. Keep your distance. And we'll get you vaccinated as soon as we can. That's great. Wonderful. Marva, there's, there's also, uh, I think it's an, a post of mine from yesterday or the day before that outlines the timeline for the vaccines we're expected to receive. Read it because it's really, really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Now it is right on 815 and so we are going to close but I just wanted um, to ask Dr. Mercer to um, ever so quickly, there have been a couple of questions about uh, your ability to close malls, given that you can close schools. So can you clarify that for those folks who've put that in the, in the Q&A? Yeah, so a uh, great question. And yes, uh, I do have the uh, authority to close malls. I would have to be able to demonstrate in the same way I, I had to do it for schools. You have to have evidence that malls are a source of transmission. So you, you would think so. I mean, intuitively we look, we see all those people there. Um, sometimes it's hard to prove though. If we don't know where people um, get it from when we find cases of COVID, it's sometimes really hard to prove that it's a mall. Um, I would agree though, that malls are very worrying indoor environments where if there's a crowding, um, then that's a problem. They are supposed to count. And uh, if there's a problem with our malls, if you call public health, we will send inspectors or we'll get bylaw there uh, mm -hmm. because it is supposed to be, you know, a, a not a crowded environment if we're doing our job. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you all so much. Um, I know that we are just two minutes over. I think we could probably go another five minutes over. And the wonderful Allison, who is, you know, the maestro that is really organizing us all um, with this is in the background. And as is Tanya, who's really supporting this work. So we have folks behind the scenes that's helping us and helping the work that we do. And I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, can I ask all, all three of you to just um, take about 30 seconds and just say any last messages that you want to leave with the folks that are listening. And then uh, Tracy will come in and, and say thank you and wrap up. I'm gonna start with um, Dr. Mercer. Um, I, th I think my last word that uh, I, I would like to leave with people is um, patience and hope. Maybe it's two words and um, it, it, you know, six to eight weeks from now, it will be a huge difference. We will have a lot more people vaccinated. The, you will see an improvement. I believe that this will be our last lockdown that we will come out of this. I don't, doesn't mean that we won't have cases of disease. It doesn't mean that we might have been inconvenienced with masks, but please have hope. We are on the final stretch, follow the rules. We wanna take you and every person in your family to the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mercer. It's so great for you to be here. We really appreciate it. And Helen, please. Uh, what I would say is this third wave has hit people really, really hard. Uh, and during a time when people were already exhausted and frustrated and concerned and worried. So, um, you know, the, it's, it's like being in a tsunami, as we've talked about before on our webinars. So this wave has really knocked people off their feet. And when you think about that, think about what you need to be able to get through the next six to eight weeks, knowing that there is very much hope on the horizon, but we still have some time to manage in the water. So some people might just need a surfboard and they're okay and they're hanging on to things. Other people might need a lifeguard, someone to help them out of the water and some support. And other people might need a Coast Guard to actually come and rescue you from the water. We wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to have their needs met right now because hanging on right now looks a little bit different for everyone, but there are supports and services available for everyone no matter what you need. But please reach out, uh, whether formally or informally to make sure and pay attention to what your needs are of you and your family uh, so that you get that support. Thank you, Helen, thank you so much. Dr. Zadlik. 
Okay, these women have made me close to tears and in tears a couple of times tonight. Mm -hmm. um, that's just because I know their hearts and I know their compassion and their um, true desire to do the right thing. I am just so um, impressed with all of you. Um, I guess my biggest take home message tonight, because it's already been said by the others, uh, or the other things have been said by the others, um, and that is conspiracy uh, theories are so dangerous. And mm -hmm. so again, I'm going to address that in the next couple of posts. But if you're reading something that's not coming from a reputable source, and I'll, I'll try to educate you on how to determine if it's reputable, please don't read and please don't share. Follow the science, follow these amazing leaders we've got your back this is going to end no doubt thank you thank you so much and marie nicola and helen it's been really great and thank you to those who are listening and i know tracy is going to wrap us up we answered more than 75 questions all together the ones that came in early as well as the ones that were coming in live we have um, uh, a lot, we had more than 520 people just on this webinar. And I know that we have many, many more on Facebook Live. So we thank you so very, very much for joining us. And now over to Tracy to close it off for us for the evening. Thanks everybody. It's always kind of um, fun to put my video off and then mute and then just sit back and listen. And, um, you know, to start it off, Nicola, like you did, of just kind of setting us all straight and having that correct message. Um, and it's funny, I was looking through just Facebook messages for, for questions, and I see a comment that just said, I wish Dr. Mercer would speak to the people more often. Hearing her reasoning of closing the schools makes so much sense and cleared up so much confusion in just that five, 10 minutes. So. I think that gives us all the power and the understanding of why this is important um, and why this time is important with everybody and why we need to search for the truth and, and, and just always fight for those uh, for, for, for complete understanding. So thank you. Thank you, Marva. Thank you, uh, Nicola. Thank you, Dr. Mercer. And thank you, Anne-Marie. I always feel funny calling you Dr. Zadlik, but uh, <laughs> and Helen. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder that this is a fundraiser. Um, it started out as a Bracelet of Hope fundraiser. Uh, Bracelet of Hope is a charity that uh, Anne-Marie founded over 10 years ago. We're very passionate about it. We, we launched a mobile health unit out in Lesotho that is now testing for COVID in a remote African village, which is crazy amazing. So if you're able to support, we'd be very, very grateful. Unfortunately, the website's down tonight. I got a little alarming message. So if you don't get in tonight, please try again. Um, and just a reminder, our next webinar series is going to be on Tuesday, May the 4th at seven o'clock. Just follow CMHA's um, Facebook page and Emery's and we'll make sure we get the message out to everybody. Um, and you know, I just wanna say that I needed a lifeguard last month. I reached out and talked to a professional and I will be speaking to that professional um, many more times. Uh, and so thank you, Helen. That was really, and I needed it. And I reached out mm -hmm. and got it. And I and it just made me feel like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, I can understand that. So thinking of, of everybody um, uh, struggling, we're, we're here with you. Um, please hang in, uh, reach out to a, a loved one, reach out to all the wonderful resources that are available for CMHA. And um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your work. And we'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good, good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Put off.